Welcome back. In the last segment, we discussed how to model a real life system with some state using a program. In this segment, we are going to discuss arithmetic on very large numbers. Now, the standard representation that C++ provides con contains, allow, allows you to have numbers with only a certain precision and certain range of exponents. So, for example, if you are looking at uh, floats, you will have some 23 bits of uh, mantissa or, or significant and you will have 11 bits of the exponent. And similarly for integers, there is, so say if you have an unsigned int, in, uh, then you will have 32 bits given for representing the integer. If you say long, you may get 64 bits. But what if you want to represent very high number of digits? Okay, so these, the, yeah, so these digits that C++ provides are usually very adequate. Okay, but sometimes you may want to represent uh, numbers to very high digits. Say, for example, you might have seen the value of pi calculated to a thousand places. Okay, how do they do that? Okay, so that is that is sort of the topic that we want to talk about right now. Okay, now. It turns out that sort of the central idea in this is to mimic what you do manually. Okay, so what do you do manually? You deal with each digit separately. So you, in your, in you, when you do the arithmetic, you look at digit one at a time. So in your program as well, you typically will do something like, look, I'm going to have a thousand iterations to process a thousand digit number, something like that. Okay. Now this turns out to be somewhat involved, but what we are going to do in this segment is we are going to give you a glimpse, a very brief introduction to how this is possibly done. Okay? It is going to be a very simplified example, but it will give you some idea. The specific problem that we are going to consider is the following. So you are asked to read a thousand digit number divided by 2 and print the quotient. Okay. Now, the moment you talk about 1000 digits, there is a very natural question. How do we store a 1000 digit number? Do we need 1000 variables? Especially if we say that we want to have, we want to s separately store each digit, well, seems like there is no getting away from having a 1000 variables. And do we have to write int digit 1, digit 2, digit 3 and so on, 1000 times, even that sounds just completely painful. Well, in general, you will need to do that. Not right now, not for the program that I am going to show you, thank God, okay. you will need to do that. Okay. And very soon, we are going to see some, uh, we are going to see a C++ feature called an array which will enable you to do this very easily. But right now we do not know it. Today what we are going to do is we are going to not bother storing all the digits. Instead, we read one digit, we do everything that needs to be done with that digit and then we forget it. Okay? This may not always be possible, but it is possible for the problem that we have on our hands today. It will not work in general. In general, you will need to remember all the thousand digits. Okay? And we will do, you will see how that can be done when you have learnt arrays. But the basic principle can be understood even right now. Okay. So, suppose we have some way of getting to the, to the digits. How do we manually divide? Okay, how do we divide? So, we said we do it manually. Okay? So, let us try to understand how that happens. So let us say we want to divide this large number by 25. How do we divide it? So let me write that down. 
So, our number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. How do we divide this? We want to divide this by 25, then probably we write something like this. Okay. Then we look at the very first number. Okay. So, can this number be divided by 25 or is it is this too small? Well, if it is too small, we put a 0 over here. Okay. Then we go on to the next number. Okay. 1, 2. Can it be divided? Well, no. So, we put a 0 over here again. Then we bring in the third number. Okay. Can it be divided? Well, yes, now it can be divided. So, what kind of a quotient can we try out? Well, we can try out a quotient 4 in which we get case we get 100 over here okay, and then we subtract. So, we get a 23 over here. Okay. All right, so what is going on? So, we are going to look at some most significant digits of our dividend and this part is what I am going to call as the temporary dividend. So, we are going to divide the temporary dividend by 25. Actually, we are going to divide even this one. This one was also a temporary dividend. Okay? But say in this case, this is the temporary dividend. We are going to divide it by the divisor and we are going to get a quotient. So, we are going to subtract, that, subtract the product of the quotient and the divisor from our temporary dividend and we are going to get the remainder. What do we do with this remainder? So, we bring in the next digit, so 234. Okay? So, we bring in the next digit and attach it to the end of the temporary of the, of the remainder. But what does it mean to attach it to the end? So, this simply means we are taking remainder multiplying it by 10 and then we are adding the new digit. Okay? So, the remainder was 23, the new digit was 4, so we got 234. So, this is our new temporary dividend. So, again we are going to try and divide this temporary divide dividend by the quotient. So, what do we get? So, this time we will get a 9 over here. So, we will put a 225 over here and we will get 9 as the remainder over here. Again we continue. So, we are going to get a 95. Again we use this step remainder times 10 plus digit. Okay? as this is our new temporary dividend. Okay. So, now this we are going to have 3 as our quotient. So, we are going to get a 75 and then we are going to get as remainder 20. Okay. So, then again we are going to bring the 6 down over here and that is going to be our temporary dividend. So, this was the temporary dividend, this was the temporary dividend, this was the temporary dividend and these were also the temporary dividends. Okay. How do we form the temporary dividend? We have a remainder from the previous iteration. So, at this point we can think of the iteration, the previous remainder being 0. But if there was a previous remainder, we multiply it by 10. Then we add the new digit and that gives us our our temporary dividend. Then we try to divide the temporary dividend by our divisor okay? and the quotient goes into our solution. Okay? So, notice you, can, you, know, you will notice that we are processing the digits in a left to right order. Once we process 1, 2, 3, then this 1 is completely useless, we do not have to remember it. So, after we process 2, 3, 4, these digits are completely useless. So, we are at, at any time we are at most keeping one extra digit beyond the size of this, of this uh, divisor. Okay? So, all the previous digits we do not have to worry about. So, that is how we are going to get by without storing everything. So, we are not even reading this digits we are, uh, initially. We are going to read them only when we actually want to look at them. Okay? So, that is the idea. That is how we can get by without maintaining too much state, without remembering too much stuff. 
So again let us let me summarize the basic iteration. So the idea is we are going to construct a temporary dividend. Okay. So the temporary dividend in the very first step is simply the first digit of the dividend. So this is the huge dividend that was given to us we just look at the very first digit. In other steps the temporary dividend is formed in this manner. Okay. So which is what I have written down over here. So it is formed by taking the remainder from the previous division and attaching it the next digit okay, on the left, on the right. So that means multiplying this previous remainder by 10 and adding the next digit to it. So that is how we get the temporary dividend. Then we divide the temporary dividend by the, by the divisor. Okay. The quotient goes to the end of the overall quotient generated so far. Okay, so 4 went here, then 9 went here, 3 went here and so on. Are we keeping track of the quotient? Are we remembering the quotient? No, we do not have to. As soon as we know that this is a digit of the quotient, we just print it. And we know that we are going to be printing digits in this order. So they will get, they will come out in the right order. Okay. And the remainder from this division, so we did a division over here. So from this division we got a quotient which goes to the end of the overall quotient generated so far and the remainder is used in the next temporary dividend. Okay. So I have just written down what I have shown you in this division over here and that is exactly what we are going to mimic in the program that I am going to show you next. Well before I get to the program there is a small technical problem. So we said we want to read in the digits of a thousand digit number one at a time, but how do we read it? Does C++ even allow us to do that? Okay. So here is what might seem like the natural strategy. So we might say in digit and then we might read each of those thousand digits one at a time. Okay. Will this work? Well if we type in the digits consecutively in this manner then it will not work. We won't get 1 the first time we read it. The first time this command executes C++ will try to construct this whole thing into a single number and put it, put that into the digit. Okay? So that is not going to quite work. Okay? If we put a space in between the 1 and 2 then C++ will get a 1 for us. So that is one possibility. Okay. So we instead of typing in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, whatever the digits are, we put, in, put spaces in between. Then each time we read, we will get exactly one digit. Okay. But there is an alternate idea which is slightly nicer, which I think you should know about and therefore I am going to discuss it. So I am going to not read integers at all, I am going to read in characters. So I am going to have a character variable C and I am going to read in into, into that character variable. Oh, I am sorry, this should have been uh, C here, not char, just a C over here. Okay? So we are going to read in into C. So it will read the ASCII representation of one character. Okay? Now I have what was typed into this variable C. So what is in the C? So suppose I typed 6, it contains the ASCII representation of that character 6. So I am going to subtract from that ASCII representation of character 6, the ASCII representation of character 0 and put the result in digit. I claim that this is going to be the digit that you really wanted to read. Okay, Let us see why. So the point to note first is that the ASCII representations of 0, 1, 2, the digits are in order and they in particular they are 48, 49, 50 okay, and so on. 0 has 48, 1 has 49, 2 has 50, 3 has 51, 4 has 52, 5 has 53 and 6 has 54. Okay. So, at this point when I have just read in and this should be C and not cap, okay, at this point C would get the number 54 inside it. 
this 0 is the ASCII value of uh, the character 0 which is 48. So, when you perform this, this result will in fact be 6 and so digit will in fact become 6. So, this is how you extract, this is how you extract, uh, 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 this is how you extract digits from characters, you subtract the character representation of 0. Okay, so, now we are ready to write the code. So, let me remind you, we have this notion of a temporary dividend that we are going to form and for that we need to know what the remainder from the previous time is. So, we are starting with this, at this point there is nothing previous, so the remainder is 0. Then we are going to process each digit. So, there are 1000 digits let us say and we are going to process them and so what happens? Well, we are going to read in each digit, then we are going to extract the actual digit value. So, as we just said it is going to be C minus 0, the ASCII for 0. Then this is the temporary dividend that I am going to form. So, what was that? We said that earlier it is going to be the remainder times 10 plus the digit that we just read. Okay? And now this is going to be divided by the divisor. Okay? So, the divisor in this case let us say we have fixed it 2. Okay? So, we just want in the problem statement we said that we want to halve it. So, this is the quotient dividend upon 2 and if you remember coming back to this picture we divided this temporary dividend by the divisor and whatever the quotient was 9 we just declared as a digit of the final answer. Okay? So, that is exactly what we are doing over here, this is, a, this is a digit of the final answer and we are printing it out right away, we do not have to do anything to it further. So, we are just going to printing, we are going to print it out. So, every time we figure out a digit of the final answer we are just going to print it off. So, that is what is being done, but that is not enough. Okay? We need the remainder as well. So, what is the remainder? The remainder is simply dividend mod 2. So, if you wanted to divide by 25, we could just have had, we would just have had to have 25 over here in both of these places, that is it, that is the only change. And that is it, we just repeat this so many times and at the end of it, we will have the quotient as we want. We will also have the remainder the variable remainder will contain the remainder at the end of the division. So, we could print it out if you want, but in this code we have not printed it. Okay? All right. So, in this manner we will be able to divide any number which fits in a single C++ integer variable. So, as I said instead of the 2 over there you put in whatever number you want, but not you cannot say I want to divide a 1000 number, a 1000 digit number by another 1000 digit number. Okay. So, for other operations you will need to read the entire numbers first, okay. you need arrays which, which uh, will be taught soon and uh, in, in this code we supplied how many digits there are in our number. Okay. You might say look why cannot we have, why do we need to do that, is that is not that inconvenient. Okay. So, can we have the number terminated by space. Unfortunately, this arrow arrow command, this uh, greater than greater than command, this operator ignores spaces. So, there is some other kind of command which we need to learn, which we will learn a little bit later, okay? but for now it cannot be done. However, if you want to terminate it by a semicolon or stop or comma or any other printable character, that is possible. Okay? Alright, so before I conclude actually I think maybe we should take a look at the code and, and run it. Okay. So, let us say I look at this code called hover.cpp. Okay. So, this is exactly the same program, oh I think I have called my character x rather than c okay. and I have put in 20 over here. Okay. I do not want to put 1000 because I do not want to put 
thousand, I, I do not want to have 1000 digits. In fact, I do not even really want to have 20 digits when we are testing. So, let us say we will just put 5. Okay. Of course, you will say 5 they will fit. Oh, so let, let me put let me put say 11. Okay. 11 will certainly not put, fit or let me put say 13. 13 digits will will they fit? No. Thir 15 will certainly not fit in, in a single int. Okay. So, let us see let us see what happens. So, let me uh, compile that okay, and run it. Okay, so, now I am supposed to give a 15 digit number. So, let me do that. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. What happens if I, so this is half of that number. Okay. Does it seem right? Well, yes. So, 2 gets me 6 over here, 3 gets me 1, so 14, 7, 5, 2, 6 carry from 1 here, so 8. Okay, it seems reasonable. Okay. So, I am getting I am getting the right answer. Okay, and well you could say look why can we do something so that this leading 0 is not printed. Of course, you can do something, but that will require a little bit more programming and maybe that is a good exercise for you to take this code and modify it. All right, so let me get back to the presentation. Actually, we are at the end of uh, not only just this segment, but the entire uh, lecture, uh, this segment sequence. Okay. So, this is these are concluding remarks on the entire uh, sequence. So, I want to observe that loops are really fundamental. Okay. You can do a lot using loops. Okay. So, we already have seen lots of things even before today's uh, lecture sequence. But even in today's lecture sequence, we saw lots of interesting things. So, for example, loops are sort of the primary structure that you need to the control structure you need to use in order to go through a domain and figure out which elements in the domain satisfy all the constraints that you are interested in. Okay. Or a loop can allow you to step through and process the interaction with the world one at a time. So, in each iteration you process one command that the world is throwing at your system and you generate how your system is responding to it. So, again a loop is absolutely a crucial control structure. And we looked at reading in from the keyboard and we said that if you type a 15 digit number, then you have to read it out, read it in as a character and then convert it into a digit. Okay? And then we can string those digits together to make a number. But this whole process which, which I just showed you is something that C++ does routinely. So, when you type in a number to your program, C++ is doing something like that. It is extracting a digit, then it is saying, oh, is this digit ending over here or is this the next digit and the previous digits that I have accumulated so far should be multiplied by 10 and then this new digit should be added to it. So, that code that I showed you something similar is used by C++ just to read in what you type. So, so far we have been saying that when you type 365, 365 magically goes into the variable you are C inning into. That is not really what happens. C++ is taking each of those digits, each of those digits as characters and then converting them and accumulating them together and that is how the number actually goes and sets into your variable. So, all this is being done with a single loop program and note that single loop programs do a lot. Well, sometimes you will have to nest a loop, nest loops of course. So, if you have a, if your domain has two variables or in other words you think of it as a two dimensional domain, then you will have to have nested, nested loops, but it is loops. Okay. All right. 
so that concludes this uh, lecture sequence. We introduced a bunch of new application themes over here and we saw that loops are very powerful and we got a lot of practice using loops. Thank you. Thank you.